Good afternoon. Welcome to this workshop, Psychic Hygiene, uh, Using the Tarot for Psychic Health and Wellness, a continuation of another workshop that I've done already for Psychic Hygiene. And if you're not familiar with the topic, it's the idea that we take care of our bodies, we brush our teeth, we take our showers, but how do we clean our mind? How do we clean our soul? So this is a continuation of that topic and how we achieve that. And an interesting twist on the tarot to look at it in a different way. I want to go ahead and give credit to Michael Tassarion. He is the owner and creator of the Mystery School. And the idea of what I'm about to explain to you, which is called the Path of the Fool, uh, was created by him. And I wanted to do it in a slightly different way, a more condensed way than he did it, maybe adding some of my own ideas along the way. But I definitely wanted to credit him. And if after this you are more interested to, to learn more, um, definitely go to his website at Terrascopes.com, um, or watch his Path of the Fool series there at Unslaved.com. So what is the Path of the Fool? Well, if you're not familiar with the tarot, the tarot consists of 22 major arcana. And the rest of the cards in the tarot are minor arcana and the court royal cards. But today, we're only going to cover the major arcana. And they go from the fool to the world, from 0 to 21, for a total of 22 total cards. And hidden in the major arcana is a story. And this is a story I'm about to tell you, and it's going to help you understand yourself more than I hope you, you have before. And we all go through these rites of passages. These troubling times that require us to learn or grow or reach an understanding or synthesize these com conflicting thoughts, ideas, and events in our life. It's something that we all share. It's ontological, meaning that it's at the foundation of our being. We have to go through this. And... In a very fascinating way, the tarot exposes this psychological process. The overworld cycle runs from the fool to the wheel of fortune, and we start to descend into the underworld cycle from justice and to finally the universe of the world. But before we start, I wanted to give you a crash course in numerology. Because your birthday, hidden within it, contains your day number and your life number. So, for fun, I thought it would be a good idea to have you figure out what your day number is and what your life number is before we start. So as we come to the major arcana that corresponds to that number, you can spend a little bit more of a deeper reflection on what that card means to you. Does it resonate with you, or does it not? And believe me, it's not uncommon for people to say that it doesn't resonate with them. That's actually a common thing. And if that's the case, I want you to think about attuning to that concept, the meaning behind that card. Because perhaps, consider this, that you're, you're not resonating with your true self, and perhaps that's something you need to explore. And there are reasons why you wouldn't resonate with your true self. There are masks that we put on. There are labels that we take on that prevent us from seeing who we really are, which was discussed in the first class before this. So I have an example up here. So if you want to, go ahead and take the time to figure out what your life number is. And if you need help, I'll help you. 
But just to give you an example, say the birth date of the United States of America. So the United States of America, just by its sun sign, is, is a cancer. And cancer relates to the chariot card, actually, which it, part of the chariot card has to do with movement. He's in a vehicle. This is where you get, this is the root word for chasis or chassis, for what a vehicle is built upon. And America is known for its love of cars, the idea that a, fr- a car provides you freedom to move about, to ride on your chariot. And I would say the United States embodies that. And this is a very, you know, a generalization, but it's interesting to point some of these things out. Like, wouldn't it be interesting to look at when certain car companies were founded? Wouldn't it be interesting to see if they started in a sign of cancer? Was it by chance or was it on purpose? <clears throat> so, continuing on. If you aren't familiar, if this is the, the first time you've ever dealt with anything with astrology or tarot, go ahead and take the time to figure out <clears throat> what your sign is. Because as we go through the cards, we'll be discussing what sign it corresponds to. And so the card will actually help you understand your sign more. In fact, the divination arts, in its holistic form, is the tarot, numerology, Astrology and the Kabbalah, or the Kabbalistic tradition, combined. That's the divination arts. You can, do, you can just do tarot, and that's, that's fine, that's part of it. You can just do astrology, that's fine, that's part of it too. But once you really combine all of them, you're going to see a bigger picture. The divination artiste truly will use all four, and we'll be looking at all four. And... In the middle of this, I want you to understand, too, we're only looking at the Rider Waite deck in this example. There's many decks. The Rider Waite deck was commissioned in 1910 by the Golden Dawn. And um, their particular rendition is very symbolically rich and accurate, in my opinion. So that's the one that I chose for this particular class. And this is one interpretation of many Symbols, as we discussed in the first class, can have so many layers, so many meanings. And the point of a symbol is that it is infinite. It is connecting you to the infinite. There's many layers to this, and hopefully this will stir some of your creativity as we discuss some of the symbolism behind these cards. And one last thing before we start exploring the path of the fool, I want to discuss with you what modalities are. So each card... <clears throat> is going to be associated with one of three modalities, cardinal, fixed, or mutable. So a cardinal event is an initiation of a certain phase of your life. So imagine going to school for the very first time as a kid. That was a, quite the cardinal event. Being born was the most cardinal event of your personal life. And the fixed routine, way to imagine that, is the day in, day out, uh, process of you know, going to school five days a week, you have your, your weekends, another five days, and then your mutable stage is, say, getting out on summer break or graduating from high school and leaving to go to college or somewhere else or uh, transforming in some way. And these comes in many shape, shapes and forms, cardinal, fixed, and mutable, but almost any process could be looked at through this lens of these three modalities. But I wanted to cover that with you because it's important to understand this concept before we start looking at each individual card. So the first card, notice how we're not starting out with the number one. We're starting out with the number zero. And the number zero is in one way whole with itself. It's not divided by anything. In another way, you could consider it to be nothing. Isn't it a zero? Isn't that supposed to represent nothing? And what is this fool? What's going on here? Well, this is the beginning 
of our path and and anything that you start in your life, whether it be a new job, a new relationship, being born, we all start out as the fool. What that means is, is we don't know what's going on. And that's sort of the negative part of it. We have this errancy about us. We notice the fool, he's very close to the edge of a hill. Very close to danger without even realizing it. As many of us start out, you know, as kids, we don't necessarily know truly what's coming around the corner for us. We don't know any better, but we learn. And notice the dog that's accompanying the fool. Well, the dog symbolizes, in part, the dog is man's best friend. There to guide us. Nature, as I discussed in the first part of this series, will never leave you. Will always be your guide. So even if you are starting out in whatever cardinal event that this is for you, never forget that nature is there for you. No different than man's best friend. No different than than a dog that's there to assist. And so this is, a, this is the positive side of the fool, of being, you know, starting an adventure, starting something new. That anxiousness that we all have inside of us where we want to start something that really shakes things up. We may not do, know what we're doing. You could call it the ugly first step. You know, sometimes you don't get to know everything about what you're doing before you do it. It can be scary. But the fool... He's very lighthearted. He doesn't mind. He's ready to go. And that's, that's a good thing. And we'll be discussing some of the positive and negative aspects to each one of these cards. And they all have a, a positive and negative aspect, for sure. So, rightfully so, this is a cardinal card. And back to the, the concept of the zero. Yeah, you're starting your journey... But if the journey is, is zero, is nothing, well, this is the whole point behind the, the Taoist tradition. From nothing comes something. This is what the zero is symbolizing here. And if you look at you know, physics, look up the Kashmir effect. In the vacuum, spontaneous generation of photons from nothing. This is fundamental to our being, And fundamental to nature. From nothing comes something. So, rightfully so, zero is a good number for this card. It was not picked on accident. And I've included the the planet rulers and the astrological correspondence. And we're not going to cover much astrology here, but if you do know astrology, just use this as a uh, way to corroborate what that planet means to you. Because they'll, they'll, like, they, they connect. This is part of the divination arts. Okay, so we all started out as the fool, but what's the very next step? The very next step is this card, the magician. This is the card... Of mastery. Because we come into this world and there's these other people, these other objects. How do we interact with these people? How do we interact with these objects? Are we just going to fumble around for the rest of our days? No. We, just like a child gets up and starts falling, skinning his knees, learning how to ride the bike, we all learn to master the world around us. Now, of course, we can't master everything, but I'm talking about your particular uh, set of interests, your, the skills that you want to take on, the skills that you want to learn about, um, social skills, business skills, vocational skills. So, and, and on his table, even, the magician has a disc, a cup, a sword, and a, and a staff, or a wand, rather which is the four elements of the tarot. Your minor arcana consists of wands, cups, 
disks and sorts. So what are you mastering? You're not just mastering any old thing. You're also mastering the four elements. Air, water, fire, and earth. And what does this co correspond to psychologically? It corresponds to Jung's quaternity of consciousness, which was covered in the first class. So if you don't remember, <clears throat> that was thinking, sensing, intuiting, and feeling. Water is feeling. Earth is thinking. Fire is sensing. And air is intuiting. And so how, when you're doing this crash course, this air, and I believe the... <clears throat> The fool was air as well. And he, he was a very airy character. The magician is air too. And this is sort of your intellect being applied. As the child, as you're coming out learning everything, <clears throat> it happens intuitively. Nobody's teaching you how to you know, walk. You're learning this on your own. Or how to talk. You're learning this on your own. You're, you're mimicking the other people and it's just coming to you. And we discussed intuition in depth. In the previous class. So the magician, it, it is no mistake that he has those four objects on his table. That's what he is mastering. The four ways in which we perceive reality. And of course, imagination undergirds all of those. And then we look at the number, the number one. There seems to be a strength in the number one, a solidness. With number one. One is one. Oneness. A sense of wholeness. And that's how we <clears throat> start out. There's really just you and your interaction with this other object outside of you um, as you learn to master the things around you. The planet ruler uh, Mercury, if you've ever heard the term uh, mer mercurial, it's an actual adjective to describe someone intelligent adept the magi and the symbol above the magician's head the limnascate it might look like an infinity sign but the actual term for it is limnascate and what that means <clears throat> is it's sort of like a feedback loop if you traveled the path of the symbol you're going out and in. Out and in. You're reaching out to the world and you're coming back for reflection. Reaching out, coming back. That's how we learn. There's a time to rest and a time to go out and play. And there's a cycle to this. And he's not learning in any, any particular place, any, any old place. It's, it looks like a garden. And nature that he's learning. And nature will teach you. The high priestess following along. So the magician was more out on the, obviously a masculine card. This, this male magi. And here we find this feminine card. It's a water card corresponding to you know, emotions. Planet ruler is the moon. You know, the moon symbolism down there. Notice the scroll that she's holding. It's T-O-R-A. Torah. Well, where do you think the name tarot came from? The original Hebrew text, which is the Kabbalistic tradition, is the Torah. It's a very small change when they, the tarot got its name from Torah. And this is an acknowledgement of that. But the secret scroll. Because the high priestess, I mean, she even brings along with her a sense of <clears throat> occultism or secrecy, which is sort of a negative aspect to the card. Um, the secret society type of stuff. Oh, and magician, I, I forgot to mention the negative side to the magician before we move on too, too far, is that that's sort of the scientism that comes along with it, where there's nothing wrong with science in and of itself, but being dogmatic 
being closed-minded. Um, and, and, the magi, and the magi path is one of the negative traits. Yeah, you're mastering things, but don't, the self-appointed rule authority of saying that's right and that's wrong, when they, maybe you've taken it too far. So the high priestess, <clears throat> she's sitting on a chair, gives it sort of the stable look to it. But behind her is a cloth. And if you look closely, it's, it's actually representative of the tree of life. And behind the cloth is a body of water. Now, a lot of the symbolism in the tarot, in the Thoth deck especially, but we'll still stick with the, the Rider weight deck here, has a lot to do with Egyptian symbolism. A lot of the symbolism, a lot of the texts from the original Hebrew text came out of Egypt. There is a huge connection between the Torah and Egypt culture. And it could be argued that the body of water behind her is the Nile. In fact, the moon that's sitting at her feet is in the lower quartile, which is when the Nile rose at its height. which so happened in Leo at the time of ancient Egypt. So there's a lot of evidence that that would be the Nile River. And the two pillars on her left and the right could be the banks of that river. One is arid, one is fertile. But then think about the number here, the number two. Remember, we talked about the strength of number one. Does two somehow imply weakness? Or could we look at two as a different kind of strength, a subtler strength? Because the high priestess card is actually, when we talk about water here, there's something subtler going on. Because things aren't always as they seem. Are they? We grow up and we're a kid and we're mastering the objects around us, but then we slowly start to understand that not everybody tells you the truth all the time. And you have to look beneath the surface to get to the heart of a matter at times. Remember, this is the, the negative side, the occult side. But the positive side is, is that you can learn through an emotional way to kind of detect these hidden truths. And it's no different than the child who has, doesn't have object permanence yet. You know, when we're growing up, <clears throat> you, you remove an object from a child's vision, and it, it, to them is, it's as if it disappears. Well, the high priestess, that part of our psyche is saying, ah, the object is still there even though you can't see it. So we start to develop different points of views as we start to, to grow. And this happens in... Like I said, in any rite of passage, I'm just using the, the uh, example of the child developing here. Because it's easier to, to show here. But as we learn that there are different perspectives, <laughs> there, we start to see how complex everything is. And the moon is very relevant here. The moon is a symbol of this. Ask yourself this question. Do you see the moon as it is? Or as the light shines upon it? It's up there every night. And every night there's a slight shift. And yet we see it in real time. Yeah, there's a way to look at something in the light and in the dark. This is important for us as we go through life to realize this. That when someone comes up to us and starts talking. Yes, there is the, the outward expression that they're... They're showing us, and then there's a more subtle expression, perhaps through body language, or they're trying to hide something, for better or for worse. This is where we learn subtlety, almost like the, the woman's intuition. And then I ask the question, because we'll look at other cards, you kind of see the magis in our society. You know, we have our scientists and stuff like that. Uh, we'll, we'll cover the empress and the, and the emperor next. We have our kings. We have our priests. 
But where are our high priestesses? Where have they gone? Where are those who hold the knowledge, like she's holding the scroll and teaching our young? Do they have a place in our society anymore? Have they been removed? Have they removed themselves? Perhaps there is a lack of proper feminine leadership. And any of those, say, any of those who do rise to the occasion merely take on a masculine role and don't really bring to the table what the high priestess should be bringing to the table. Perhaps we're lacking that. And we suffer for it as a culture. But even delving into the number two even further, the idea that I discussed very thoroughly in the last workshop was the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious, or the object and the subject. Do we not need two for this play to work? Do we not need two to tango to interject? Consciousness interjects into the unconscious? Perhaps there is a great strength in two. And we will be discussing this very thoroughly throughout this, this class. The Empress. Beautiful card. Element, Earth. Very fitting. Think of the Mother Earth. This is part of what the Empress represents. The rod she's holding in her right hand. Notice it's tilted, just like the Earth is. The Earth has the same tilt on its axis as it revolves around the sun. She's sitting out in nature. There's a body of water running by her. There's grain in front of her, implying fertility. The planet ruler, Venus, Venus is about beauty in one aspect, which the Empress very much embodies. <clears throat> she even has the sign of Venus sitting in a heart shape right at her seat. And it's a very flowy seat compared to the high priestesses. And if you want to think about the relationship between the high priestess and the Empress... Imagine a beautiful flower, which is sort of what the empress represents, beauty and nature. But there's still seed, a seed that gave birth to that plant, to that flower, underneath the earth. The high priestess is hidden. She's the seed that germinates, but the empress is the beautiful flower that blooms. Two sides of the same coin of the feminine consciousness. And this will be important for later, but notice how the female archetype is coming up pretty early in our path of the fool. And it's important that we come across the mother, right? The mother is teaching us. She's the one who, there's mother's milk. She's the one who holds us first. We were tied to her through the umbilical cord. In the hermetic tradition, the three mother they're called the mother letters of the Hebrew alphabet Elaf, Amim, and Shayin the three mother letters once we're talking about the number three here how appropriate is this Aleph means to take a breath in Amim was the pause point where you can't take any more in and Shayin is when you're letting it go and the idea was that the Amen, Amim, was the return to enlightenment, shining to, to enlighten. Amen. It's the M is the only letter in our alphabet where you have to close your mouth to pronounce it. In fact, it's at the center of the English alphabet. This is the subtle symbolism that it just grows through our culture without us realizing it. In fact, the two center letters are M and N. So where did we get the word Amen from? Amen is the closing, that's that center point, 
where we're no longer moving, there's this peace and balance before we return back to where we started. Perhaps that's where the number three three is quite appropriate. Earth, the third planet from the sun. She represents Mother Earth. This is all intertwined. They knew what they were doing when this deck was made. This This is our ancestors putting together this knowledge and and layers that (laughs) I'm only scratching the surface on. And there can be a negative side to the Empress, can't there? Can, Can beauty not be used for power to accomplish negative things? Can a mother not be wrathful to the child? Can Mother Nature not have its more destructive side? Of course it can. But every child experiences this through the mother, for better or for worse. Moving on. The Emperor card. Complimenting the Empress right after, and of course we will run into the father figure, the masculine side to life, the governor, the president, the the king. We're very familiar with the negative and positive archetypes here. We have a lot of uh, shows and books that talk about the tyrant king. We have a lot of history about the tyrant king. And... You can see here, th- this is truly where the, the signs start to correspond. The first cards are ruled by Aries, but that's just because they're the beginning cards. There's, there's 22 cards, but only 12 signs. But if, an, if you're an Aries, this is truly the card that corresponds to that astrological sign. Ruled by Mars. The number four, well, that corresponds to the quaternity, perhaps. There's a square, has four sides. He's sitting on a, a very squared-off throne. Remember, the empress's was very flowy. The emperor is very uh, cornered, structured. And this is where you do get that order, that masculine order from. And from a negative standpoint, it could easily be argued that we, as a species, we have endured a great amount of malignant order from the tyrant king, for sure. And I'll give you that, we all need a break from the tyrant, whether it be a political figurehead, a king, or even a parent. Absolutely. But that isn't to say that you remove order altogether. That adage of, you know, children crave structure. Yes, they do. People crave structure. There is definitely a positive side to order. And this is a card that represents the laws of the land, so to speak. As you're moving through life, the fools learning the world around them, well, guess what? You grew up in a culture that has laws and speed limits... Hey, there's the king, and you got to answer to the king. Whether it be a, a chief of a tribe or, you know, president, governor, you name it. There's rules. You can even see the ram's heads on his seat, definitely corresponding to, you know, Aries symbolism. And so how we embrace this order, how it's given to us, you know, it can be toxic or hygienic. It could be healthy. We need, we need order. And this is the, the fool, when he started off, he had all this you know, flowiness to him, but eventually you need discipline. You need structure. <laughs> if you don't have that, you won't make it that far in life. Try anarchy. It doesn't last. It's a self-correcting belief system. (laughs) 
moving on. So, along with the order of the law of the land, you also run into the priest class, the hierophant. He is the spiritual law, the spiritual order. Because whether you realize it or not, whether the fool realizes it or not, there is also a deep-seated need for spiritual order, emotional order. And so, the Hierophant has his place at number five. Very interesting, the number five. The number five comes from the Greek symbol phi, which is a circle with a line that goes right down the center of the circle. And that is a symbol of the finger over the mouth. The man who knows does not speak. Does the Roman Catholic Church not have an underground library that's airtight sealed that they prevent anyone from looking at? Of course they do. There's a lot of secrecy, as, as there has been for thousands of years in many different priest classes, about knowledge, which can be obviously the, the negative side to the hierophant um, can be seen throughout history. There have been spiritual leaders who have taken advantage of the working class or the, the non-priest class. Just uh, ask South America. Where's the indigenous people? I, went to Ur- I lived in Uruguay for a year. There are no indigenous Uruguayans anymore. There's definitely been a <laughs> history of a violent priest class. But... There can be a positive hierophant. Imagine, if you will, the, the leader of an orchestra, the orchestrator, leading all those different musicians, creating a whole piece of music, creating that spiritual order, that flow, and channeling it into something greater. Now, whether or not you run into malignant hierophants or not, you know, depends on your culture. <clears throat> but the fool will run into them nevertheless. So we run into these archetypes no matter what culture you're going to be in. It's inescapable. And the element here is earth. Actually, and this card does have to do with with earthly things. It's fixed. He's sitting on his seat. And it has to do with Taurus. Moving on. The lover's card. Quite the misunderstood card. Number six. Well, first off, its element is air. So remember, that's kind of uh, intuitive. And this is our first mutable card that we're running into. So there's a change going on here. So pay attention, Geminis. So this card is is kind of counterintuitive. You see the man and the woman there, but they're not necessarily the two lovers, so to speak. The angel... At the top, the sort of the hands are pressing to the left and the right. She's actually separating them. In fact, if you look up the description of this card, if you're doing a reading, this card isn't about combining anything. This is about crossroads, junctions, choices, decisions, termination of relationships, whether it be with a job, a person. So lovers is kind of an odd choice of words, isn't it? So what's going on here? Well, notice how the man is looking at the woman. But the woman is looking up at the angel. It's interesting, isn't it? But the symbolism behind the, the, the female here is the classic 
serpent around the tree, which is used in a lot of different stories. Most of you are probably familiar with the story of Adam and Eve. You know, this is definitely a, very close to it, this idea. But what if <clears throat> this idea here, behind the female and the tree of knowledge, what's so bad about wanting knowledge? What's so bad about... I mean, I know the story that we're told in the Bible talks about you know, Eve being the fall of man. But I want to read something to you uh, quickly from the book called Kabbalah for the Modern World by Majin Gonzalez Whipler. In 1515, a book entitled The Polyglot of Paris was published by Cardinal Ximenes with the permission of the Vatican. This book was extraordinary in the fact that it presented the book of Genesis printed in three different languages. Each page was set in three columns. The first column presented the original Hebrew text, the second column had the Latin Vulgate, and then the third was printed the Greek Septuagint. The cardinal's intention was to show that the Vulgate had been crucified between the other two versions, but that it was nevertheless the true word of God. The fact that the Vulgate had been adulterated, the adulterated product of the Greek and Hebrew versions did not occur to the good cardinal, who nevertheless did the world a great service by presenting it with a rare copy of the Mosaic Hebrew text, which had been zealously guarded for over 3,000 years. Now, one of the things that scholars were able to find when those texts were compared to each other was that a lot of the stories in Genesis never occurred in the original Hebrew text. The idea that Eve was given birth to by Adam, by a rib no less, that came later. That was not in the original Hebrew text. You could even consider that as a slight against women from our particularly patriarchal church. But... If that's true, and there's a lot of, this is a whole other topic in and of itself. I'm not going to delve too far into it, but I'm just kind of stirring up creativity here, or the, the idea of the, to research on your own. <clears throat> but what if the female in this lover's card is looking to the angel of wisdom? Maybe, you know, maybe this, this angel is the goddess of wisdom, Sophia, which is where we get the word uh, philosophy. Philo means love of. Sophia is wisdom. The love of wisdom. And it was that same love of wisdom that drew Eve to the knowledge to begin with. It wasn't Adam. But if Eve has a falling out with wisdom, is Adam lost? If the female loses her quote-unquote female intuition, or the the woman's intuition, would man not be lost? Notice the the burning branches behind the man. And this is kind of indicative of that masculine fieriness, the, the, the going out and doing something. You know, the, the emperor was a fire. You know, Ares, it's fire. But in that doing, <clears throat> you may lose touch with being. Being who you are. And maybe this isn't just the the relationship between the man and the woman. But rather, the masculine and feminine qualities inside you. And if the feminine part of you is no longer looking towards wisdom, where you sit with it, you try and understand the cosmos and God and everything, your masculine side will be lost. Because we have plenty of intelligent people around us. Look at what we've created with our civilization. We can go to the moon if we wanted to. We have robots doing surgery for us. Yeah, we're intelligent. But intelligence isn't wisdom. Wisdom is knowing what to do next. What's the point in knowing everything if you don't know what to do with it? So yeah... The masculine part, the magi, may have all of this mastery. But if you lose touch with the feminine, you won't know what to do with it. And it could become a very negative thing. 
<clears throat> Another aspect of this card is at one point in our lives, and this is a very this is a duad here. This is a male and a female that that are interacting here. The masculine and the feminine. Regardless of who you are, eventually the question will come up. Why are you doing any of this? Remember, the man, the masculine is going out and doing all this stuff. The feminine is trying to get in touch with what to do next. But why? What's the point? And in fact, are you doing it because of some goal? Or... Are you doing it for the sake of doing it? Why does a dog chase a car? It, it knows it's not, going to ch- it's not going to catch the car, but it chases it anyway, and it loves it. Are we lovers of the hunt? Is this what this card means? Going even deeper. Any time that we choose to do anything, do we not negate doing other things? What is love? I mean, here's the title of the card, The Lovers. Well, what is love? Put quite simply, love is energy. Yeah, no matter who you are, you have to decide what you're going to give your energy to. What do you love? Is it a goal? Is it a way of life? We talked about this in uh, the first part about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how you may be working for something, trying to get more and more money, you've already satisfied that need, and you don't even know why you're doing it anymore, and you feel empty inside, and you're still giving it energy at the expense of taking your care of yourself another way, satisfying other needs. What do you love? These are, remember, if you look at the meaning of this card, there's decisions, choices to be made. The fact that things are being pushed apart means that you have to. This, is, this will happen to all of us. We have to decide what we're doing and what we're going to give our love to, what we're going to give our energy to. It's ontological. This is a very philosophical card. It's a very mutable card. You can see why it's mutable now, because you have to make a choice. You're at a, you're at a crossroads. <clears throat> Moving on. The chariot card. Water elemental. And a cardinal card at that. So what's going on here? Well, who is this man in the chariot? Is it the fool? Has the fool grown up? You know, he's he's gone through the parents and the leaders, and he's made his choices about what he needs to do with his life, and he goes out on his own. He's, he's leaving town. He's grown up now. He's ready to, to really do something with his life, for better or for worse. And there's been many chariots to leave before him, too. He's not the first person to, to go out and do his own thing. So, will you fall into the rut of the chariots that have gone before you? They've cleared out a path. Or are you going to go your own way? In fact, the number seven is known to be the number of the loner in the Hindu tradition. Tradition. There's a seven gods or goddesses. The first six were each born in pairs as twins. And the seventh one was born on his own. He was the loner. So they were on to, to something there. Seven is the only number, one through nine, or zero through nine, or whatever, that does not divide into 360, which is the degrees in a circle. So there's a lot of symbolism there behind this being the loner card. Remember when I talked about America being, you know, cancer-like, and us having that, we're going to be doing it our own way. Sort of way, sort of thing. <clears throat> so, 
the fool isn't as flowy as he used to be, isn't he? He has his armor on. And what does his armor mean? Well, I discussed this in the, the previous course. It's the superego. It's the, the layers, the masks that we put on ourselves. Remember, we've, gone, we've been ran through the ringer. We just went through the parents and all the leaders. Masks, whether they be hygienic or toxic, but we, we put on these masks to deal with them. Especially if they're toxic. And so there's this armoring that takes place. But why is this a water card? Because the chariot's leaving, and this is one of the first cards that imply motion. Remember, everybody else has been kind of sitting or staring. You know, the the fool was sort of moving on his own a little bit, but this is really implying there's there's movement going on here. He is in the chariot after all. But this also implies time. You can't have movement across space without time occurring. And where did we get our first knowledge or intuitions of how time works? It actually came from the mother. When you're a baby, you get fed when the mother feeds you. Through her breast milk. When you cry, you have to wait for the mother to come to you, to aid you. So you develop, this is how you, all of us go through this. Our first sense of how our being categorizes time is actually done through the mother. And the, the feminine, the female already is in touch with time more than the man is. Do they not have pregnancy? which is a very timely thing. Do they not have menstruation? Along with the lunar cycle? See the, the lunar crescents on his shoulder? So suddenly you're starting to see some of the feminine aspects of why the symbolism was even tied into this card. But even so, notice why the high priestess was first before the empress. Well, we were interacting with the mother before we were conscious were we not? That was hidden to us. So we were developing all of these attitudes, um, categories of time, before we were conscious. And even when we go out into the world, and this is all embedded in symbolism here, this is a, a, a broad generalization, but <clears throat> there's still that feminine aspect tied with us as we go out and move into the world. But then, of course, obviously, there's the positive side of, that's great. Go forth in your chariot. Do your own thing. Be the loner. Be idiosyncratic, unique. That's great. And then, of course, the negative side is you, maybe you put up too much armoring. Maybe there's too much super ego or masks in the way that are preventing you from being authentic. And maybe you're falling into the rut of so many before you and you're not breaking the mold at all. You're going out, you're starting something, but it's not really you. Now, does that not part of the path of the fool, though? Is that not something we all have to learn on our own? As we try out different things, learn more about ourselves, moving on. The strength card, corresponding to Leo... This is very fiery. Notice the the limnascate is above her head, just in the same way that it was the magi and the magician. Perhaps this is a different octave. Going back out and coming back in. Even the number eight is another version of the limnascate. The number in itself in this card. So we have a character here, looks a lot like the Empress, kind of, and we have a lion. And she's doing something pretty brave here. She's (laughs) holding her hands around, around the lion's mouth. Well, the name of this card, Strength, 
It can mean physical strength, for sure, and emotional strength. But it also means moral strength. So the lion... Part of the symbolism, too, this is Leo, right? Well, in Egypt, the Sphinx actually corresponds to uh, the, the lion, and, but it has a woman's head. That's because when Leo ran into Virgo, which is coming up next, that was the, the year for the Egyptians. The reason why that was their <clears throat> beginning and end mark for the year was that's when the, the Nile rose and fell. That's when it reached its peak. So very... Uh, this is a lot of Egyptian symbolism here. The fact that the lion is part of Leo and going into Virgo. And the Sphinx being a symbol of that. But the lion here represents that raw veracity and fire in all of us. That part of you when you were a baby crying out to the mother. That's your needs that you're trying to meet. That It's your bioenergy. Your inner nature. And it is ferocious. But do we not at one point have to approach that rawness inside of all of us and temper it? We can't just go out and cry when we don't get our needs met. We can't just go out and get angry and punch somebody in the face. No. Of course not. We have to be a little bit more sophisticated than that as we mature. So, who is this lady here? Well, she's the ego. The conscious eye. And she's coming to the lion. But not any self-masochistic way. She's doing it gently. She has her hands around the lion's mouth and she's calming it. This is a card of self-love. Very important. And I want this to be a part of the core of this psychic hygiene concept. Because how many of us beat ourselves up For our inner lion. Yes, our inner lion needs to be tempered. But out of love. Not self-hate. Now how many people are teaching us that? How many hierophants and emperors are out there teaching us that? The empress sort of is trying to. You know, the loving mother. The one who, that archetypal mother who loves you unconditionally. She would give you that tough love or that gentle love. But the the chariot's already come and gone, right? You've already left town. Mom's not here anymore. You have to do it for yourself. Whether you had a good mom or not. And a whole workshop could be discussed here about this, about what self-love is, but this is one aspect of it of going to your inner id, your inner lion, with your ego, and being gentle with your... taking time with yourself. Be flowy like the empresses. Remember, she represents nature too in a certain way, but kind of resonate with nature. How do we achieve this balance? We know we got to do it. Do it beautifully. And remember, if this is one of your life numbers, pay attention. Does this theme resonate with you? Just as a reminder. The hermit. So we're actually coming close to the end of the overworld cycle. And the hermit, who is he? Well, he's the fool. And he's old now. Because the fool, being the fool that he is, thought that he was going to be able to
to fulfill whatever that angst was inside of him that initiated that event where I'm going to start something new. Well, not everything is so straightforward. Yeah, there's this outer world, but the fool now realizes something. That there's this inner world too. Remember, he's already had to deal with taming the lion, but that's also not good enough either. That all that armor with the chariot, that's not good enough. It's not cutting it anymore. The hermit is standing at the top of a mountain. When the fool started his adventure, and as often we all do, we say, Ah, if only we could get to the top. If only we could achieve X, Y, or Z. That'll do it. Yeah, go back to Maslow. Go back to the hierarchy of needs. Figure out how that's wrong. Well, when we get to the top, the hermit who spent his whole life getting to the top is overwhelmed because he sees across the horizon all these other hilltops. And it's so far, he can't even see where it ends. The hilltop wasn't the end. There was this whole other dimension that he couldn't reach. Yeah, he just went to the top. And in the Thoth deck, I'll show the card right now, you can even see uh, there's Cerberus at the bottom there. And the reason that's there is because the hermit realized the error of his ways and it's time to head back down because it's time to go to the underworld. Time to go to the unconscious. And this is where the element here is earth. Yeah, because you're coming back down to earth. Time to get the head out of the clouds. Time to go to, to withdraw within, to introspect. You've been extroverted this whole time as a, you know, the kid who goes out to play. You know, there's all these other people and objects the magician was, was working with. And now there's this inner world that we need to deal with. Notice the lantern that the hermit is holding. That's actually a representation of the ego consciousness, which is limited. You can only have this tiny little scope of everything. And notice the landscape. It's starting to get dark. Remember how you had to make choices about what you were going to learn, about what you were going to focus on? The hermit, with his lantern, which is useful, it's not enough to learn it all. It's not enough. We need more subtler tools to work through our rite of passage. The ego can't cut it. It serves its purpose, for sure. So the hermit, even the cloth that he's wearing, this robe, it's almost like a snake skin. It's time to shed that skin and transform. <clears throat> time to go back down the mountain. It's a mutable card. That's because the choice is being made here. The realization is made. Now, I want at this point to. I want you to understand that even though you go through this as your rite of passage, a lot of people regress because you have the choice to avoid all of this and postpone it, ignore it. Now, you can't postpone the consequences, you can't ignore the consequences. As Ayn Rand said, you can avoid responsibility, but you can't avoid the consequences of avoiding responsibility. Well, look at our society today. It's more plastic and artificial than ever. We have these artificial environments that we can hide away from and not go through these rites of passages as our ancestors were forced to do in one way or another. But this is the authentic path. 
So we come to the Wheel of Fortune. And this is sort of summing up the overworld cycle. <clears throat> it, it, it represents all the elements. It contains everything and the entire zodiac. Notice the wheel. There's English letters there. T-A-R-O-A. If you want to look at it that way. Which is tarot. Over and over and over again. Symbolizing the ever... Almost going back to what the fool was. The fool has come full circle. He's the zero card. Even the Aramaic, the Hebrew symbols here, are actually I-H-I-V, I believe. I might have to check that. Which is corresponding to Yahweh. How the Hebrews would spell out God. In fact, tarot, or ro- you could even look at it as R-O-T-A, as rotation. The rotation of the circle. Rota was one of the original Hindu goddesses that represented truth and everything. You could even argue that it was like the, the cornerstone of Hindu belief. So calling upon, upon Kabbalistic tradition, uh, Vedic tradition. There's a lot of symbolism here. Even the Wheel of Fortune is a game show. You know, it, it pops up in our, cult, in our pop culture. It's so important. You know, where do you think the name Wheel of Fortune came from? The game show. And even the number, the one and zero. (laughs) We are now one with the zero. We are now one with the circle. We've come full circle. The hermit has realized that there are limitations to just being extroverted, to just mastering objects. (laughs) What about mastering the self? That didn't occur to the Magi. That got lost somewhere. And so now we come to a very... uh, The underworld cycle, which is a very personal experience. So the first card, justice. Very important symbol in our culture. Lady Justice. And we have her blindfolded in, in front of our courts. Meaning she's, you know, justice is blind, we should be fair. And rightfully so, this card does represent laws, uh, legal issues, in one aspect. It's very airy, meaning a higher order of the mind, perhaps, intuitive. But justice, even in the Thoth deck, the name of this card is adjustment. They come from the same root word, just you know, justice and adjustment. Because if something is unjust, we adjust it. That's part of what our justice system does. If a wrong has been committed, if a crime has been committed, you can go to the courts and an adjustment will be made. That's the idea. Now that's the, the outer world part of it. But what's really being... Balanced here. We see that she's holding scales in her left hand. Left is usually feminine. And a sword in her right hand. Well, the sword is actually a masculine symbol. And it's not so much that she's balancing something on the scales. It's that she's balancing her masculine and feminine qualities. Which is the first step in the underworld cycle. That's what's going on here. So, this could be... Just as an example, let's say you've been in a toxic relationship. And for years and years, somebody just keeps walking over you. You haven't attuned to the masculine traits that you need to be hygienic. You need to be healthy. And the justice card is calling to you saying, 
Yeah, you need to get this back in order. You need order. You need balance. Or, let's say the hyper-extrovert. The partier. The one that's just going out into the sun and he keeps exploring, but he, he hasn't stopped to just be for a moment. You know, on that feminine side. My goodness, maybe you need to, to listen for a moment. And balance that back out. Because we, we're, we're just now starting to master the self. So this is a very important concept, the idea of the feminine and masculine qualities. It's not that any male or female can have both feminine and masculine qualities. It's not sex-specific or gender-specific. We, we all need it. So rather than the hierophant giving us this order, which may be toxic, <laughs> maybe not, we do it for ourselves. We start to achieve order on our own accord. And we're going to need these tools later on. We're not fighting you know, the knight in the overworld cycle. He was fighting other knights, perhaps another beast or a dragon. Now we're going to the underworld. There's different challenges here. You're not just going to be able to win everything with brawn. You're going to have to develop some subtler skills. <clears throat> and even the number, one and one. The balance between the two. Justice. The hanged man. A bizarre card, to be sure. And another card that made it into our culture. I know I played hangman when I was a kid. If you notice that, isn't that strange? That three major arcana in a row in the underworld cycle that starts it have a place in pop culture? Just anecdotally? So we already see here it's a water card, which we remember has to do with the emotion. And it's fixed. So this is strange, is it not? He's hanging upside down. Almost looks like he's bound, like his uh, arms are bound behind him. <clears throat> well, and he's hanging on a tree as well. So he's already naturally reversed. And if you've ever dealt with tarot, call, cards can fall reversed. But the hang man, he's already upside down. <laughs> so what does it mean to have an upside down hang man? Why is he upside down to begin with? Well, part of the hanged man is the process by which we achieve access to our subtler senses. So, this is to the point of why uh, certain psychic abilities, this was discussed ad nauseum in the previous class because we're delving down he, he's going upside down his head is going down remember the hermit already descended but now we're going real down we've, already, we've flipped the script we've realized that the current approach doesn't work so now we're reversing it and you can even see in the art his, his head is just illuminated you're enhancing other senses here other skills necessary for the underworld cycle this is preparation this is work. This card actually, actually has something to do with yoga, too. He's in a tree pose. He's hanging on a tree, and he's also doing the tree pose. All the decks will have him in the tree pose, actually. Part of yoga is getting in touch with those deeper senses, for sure. And the negative side of this card is, like, imagine it being reversed. Maybe you just continue to go along with that same old method. You haven't flipped the script yet. You just, you won't, you won't budge. But you need to. So this is, don't, you're not supposed to fight this cycle, but you can if you want to. And on that note, there is a relationship between 
developing these senses. Uh, I want to bring up the high priestess again and why that we don't necessarily have as many high priestesses as we should. Well, it was estimated that during the 1700s, 1800s, all of the witch hunts combined across Europe and America, the upper estimates are up, or looks at about 9 million people being killed in the witch hunts. Now, what does that mean, like practically speaking? It means that if you were a female and you were developing any deeper sense at all with yourself or had any more clairvoyant abilities or intuitive abilities, you were systematically sought out and murdered. Now, I'm not going to go too far into the history of this, but understand that it is very relevant to our culture. This did not happen not too long ago. This was very close. It's very close to home, actually. So imagine being a girl in our society and getting in touch with yourself and perhaps you touch into that quote-unquote woman's intuition, except you take it to a a level. There's already going to be a fear inside of you in your unconscious warning you, hey, you better watch out because you might get murdered. Whether that's real, I don't think you'd necessarily get murdered today for it, but does that trauma suddenly disappear? I think not. And it could keep people from from attuning to that. Remember how the male was looking to the female in the lover's card? And perhaps it's a bad thing if, we, if, if, the fem, if the feminine has lost touch with the goddess, with wisdom. Maybe the male's in bad shape too. Why do you think the witch hunts happened? This is a rhetorical question, but I just want you to think about this. They're probably perfectly, I know, that, perfectly innocent people who are just being themselves, naturally attuning to what it is to be a, a human being. And they were killed for it. I know it's not talked about all that much, but it's very relevant here for psychic hygiene. And relevant to the hanged man. I want you I wanted to warn you about this that if you do go to this part and develop these subtler senses, there's gonna be other things lurking there. Trauma unseen. This is not the overworld cycle, ladies and gentlemen. We're dealing with other challenges here. The death card. Another water card. So, the death card, much like other cards, it does not actually mean the physical ultimate death. At all. If you actually look at the card meaning, it has nothing to do with physical death. It actually has to do with the death of the false self. Notice, uh, death is riding on a pale horse. The king, you can see his crown's already been knocked off his head. There's a hierophant-looking character who's almost pleading not to, you know, to <laughs> not to be taken down just like the king was. Well, what's going on here? Well, the fool... Ri- I don't care what culture you grew up in, there's probably going to be toxic or negative emperors and hierophants in your culture. People misleading you. It's just going to happen. But part of overcoming the false self is that it is necessary. What happens automatically is that you start seeing through the lies around you. The politician who's been lying to you your entire life, I'm pretty sure that's obvious to anyone listening to my voice right now, eventually you say to yourself, wait a, moment, wait a minute, this is all a facade. I see through my layers and I now see through their layers. Because you remember you've developed the senses with the hanged man. Okay, so now we're getting to something deeper. Even... Um, and the, the Reichian point of view, Wilhelm Reich, where he said the skin was the ego, where he somatized the psyche, and the deeper self was the true self. Well, here you go. The bones don't represent necessarily death. It's just what's going on underneath. This is the true self. And so when you get in touch with the true self, necessarily 
your perception is cleaned up a bit. You're going to be able to have a better relationship with reality or more improved clarity with reality. And with it, you see through all the false mysteria that has been propagated to you your entire life by whoever it was. <laughs> so, this is an obvious step because if you tolerate this, if you keep buying the lie, you're never really going to make... Imagine the toxic relationship again. This is just an example. If you're the rite of passage... If you're if that, that toxic person and they keep telling you, oh, I love you. I mean, I know I beat you physically, but I love you, so keep buying that lie. Eventually, you, if you don't see through that and if you continue to tolerate it, you're not going to make it. So this is the process of seeing through the lies. The death of the false self. Temperance. What an important card. Aren't we in the underworld cycle? The other cards were very bizarre, dark, right? Hanged man, death. Even justice started out with a little darkness. Yeah. But then we have this light card. It's fire and it's mutable. This card is something that is probably going to be skipped, the theme anyway, it's going to be skipped by every institution in our entire culture right now. Much in the same way that Leo, another fire card, was, had the concept of self-love, this card is the pinnacle of self-love. And the reason... This is so important. is because it doesn't matter how smart you are, how much energy you have, how tough you are. If you do not develop self-love, you will not make it through the underworld cycle. It's just not going to happen. But what kind of self-love are we talking about? Remember, I always already said that love is energy. Well, this is a card of sophistication. And it's a fire card because there may be parts of you that are still infantile, that won't budge. Perhaps it's an old belief system that doesn't serve you anymore, or a lie that you believed in your whole life, or I, not even that. Maybe it's two legitimately perfect things in your life that one has to go, or you have to make a compromise. Imagine being a parent. You can't afford to be infantile anymore. You have to step up your game. You have to be more sophisticated. You're going to have to make some sacrifices. You can't just continue. Well, you can, but there are consequences. But not just having a child, but like anything, any rite of passage, there may be this huge change that you need to go through. This is a mutable card. And it's fire because things need to heat up so that everything melts. Imagine a sword that gets tempered. In order for that sword to be sharpened, it has to be heated up first. And a hammer is hitting it. It is not a peaceful process, is it? There's a lot of conflict going on here. But... It's the synthesizing of antitheticals. It's taking the water and the oil in your life and mixing them. Sophistication. Yeah, you got to go to work. Maybe there's horrible people there. Maybe you have car trouble. Maybe all these things that keep building up, all these problems, they, it gets to you, doesn't it? If you don't achieve self-love, you're, gonna, you're not going to make it. You're going to crash. If you continue to be this mindless you know, extra fool who just goes around partying, you are going to crash. 
And so you, go through, you have to go through this transformation. And it is a radical transformation. I want to... So this is an example for me. I was six. My parents did something. I was very upset. And I went, they, they told me to go to my room. And I remember being so angry. And I didn't even realize that what I was doing. It. I took a bite out of the neck of my favorite stuffed animal. And the moment that I did, I started crying. I love that stuffed animal. You know, the stuffed animal brought me a great comfort at night. And I just started bawling my eyes out. And so I made sure, much in the same way that the empress was holding, (laughs) this is quite literal, holding the mouth of the lion. I literally bit the fur off of this thing. It was like I developed a greater sensitivity to the other people around me and other objects. I mean, this is a stuffed animal, luckily. But imagine being so angry, you do something far worse. You hurt someone else. Maybe a drunkard kills somebody in a car accident. That happens. That feeling of guilt that may happen is so immense. But whatever it is inside of you, whatever it was that made me bite the stuffed animal, whatever was making that drunkard into... where they're so consumed with escaping reality that they don't even care about doing harm to others and they're getting so wasted, that needs to be tempered. And it's not easy. You have to give yourself love in order to go through this transformation and develop this sensitivity. Yeah, you have your problems, but this is about compromise. So, of course, there's five things need to be heated up so they can be molded together. Turning a glob of steel into a sword. The other cards before this were air and water, which was important because it you know, involving the mind and involving your emotions. This is involving your bioenergy. And this is why you'll fail without it. Because you need energy to think. You need energy to do all the things that you do. So without temperance, without tempering yourself, you're not going to make it. And the Thoth deck, this card is actually called Art. And Aleister Crowley meant to make to mean that as this is the art. Out of all the high arts, this is the most important one. The art of self-love. That's how high he held this card. It wasn't just any old card. And you'll see why in a little before once we cover the next card, you'll see why you need it. The devil card. If you remember the overworld and underworld cycle picture, at the very bottom of the underworld, guess who's there? The devil. Rightfully so. We all have our demons, and we all have our crosses to bear. It's an earth card. You you might talk about... You know, obviously, the, the negative sides of this are easily explained, and I'll get into what, some of the positive parts here in a little bit too. <clears throat> but notice the sign at the top of the devil's head. It's an upside-down pentagram. Interesting. What does that mean? Well, a right-side-up pentagram is actually a very positive symbol. I know pentagrams are thought to be whatever. By the way, anecdotally, how many times has the Bible mentioned Satan? I've heard people say that the tarot is evil because it has the devil card in it. Yeah, the Bible mentions Satan, I don't know how many times. The tarot mentions him once. And it's not because it's trying to be evil or exalting the devil. No, it's acknowledging the fact that we go through this. 
It's a part of life, the end of world cycle. But going back to the pentagram, where did the pentagram even come from? Well, it's actually a symbol that corresponds to Venus. Every time the Earth revolves around the Sun, Venus intersects the Earth and the Sun five times. It was actually a feminine symbol, a Venusian symbol, a Venus symbol. And it stood for hygiene, actually. Remember, beauty had a lot to do with Venus. It also has to do with being hygienic. So an upside-down pentagram is the exact opposite. Toxic. And this is what we've been brought to. This toxic place. You know, using the example of the, the toxic relationship, the devil that we're dealing with. And it's important at this point to point out one of the main concepts in the mystical tradition. And that the idea is that God had an unconscious just like we all do. And yes, God is perfect in everything that He is and that is conscious and known to God. There is all this beauty and order and perfection in that. But He wanted to know, or she wanted to know, what was going on in that unconscious. But there is a part, a, another will in God. And this is considered the, the philosophical evil, not the same evil that we talk about today, but philosophical evil. There is the evil that said, why? We're fine the way we are. There's no point in risking anything. What? We're in paradise in this perfection. And then there is another will of God that said, no. I want to know. But that didn't dispel that other will. It existed just as much as you know, the other one did. So there is a bifurcation, a splitting that took place. And God plunged himself into his own unconscious. And thus creation began. Now we have the same two wills inside of us. Remember the, the positive aspect of the fool? That, oh, let's go out and start a brand new adventure. It's okay. You could even say that the fool was an archetype for that aspect of God. Looking at the, the evil part and saying, Guy, let's just go. But the evil said no. But that was the same evil that was saying, don't go to the underworld cycle. And that's why there, there's that will inside of all of us that we all deal with. What's it? It's just an echo of God's consciousness. And going back, what, what is the positive side of the, the devil card? Do we not need the underworld cycle to tell us what is toxic? Remember biting my stuffed animal? That was horrible for me. I hated it. But because of it, I developed a deeper sensitivity, a deeper connection to myself and how I feel towards other people and myself. Remember the duality, the, the concept of the number two, the importance of introspection, the lover card? Is it not a positive thing that we have to have this split, this bifurcation in the same way that God did? And in the same way we have to deal with our devil, our evil? Absolutely. I, I would say this is the heart of, of psychic hygiene right here. This is the point of this workshop right now. To act as a guide for how this process works. So yeah, hidden within all of us is a certain toxicity that we may be unconscious of. The, the same part of me that bit the stuffed animal, I didn't want to do that. And perhaps there were other things lurking inside of me that I didn't want to do either. But that's all unconscious. 
Well, that's what the rites, rites of passages are all about. They show us things about ourselves. Even our own being. We're made up of trillions of cells which are constantly splitting apart our entire lives. And out of hundreds of trillions of cells that make us up throughout the entirety from start to finish of our being, there's one time, well, let me back up, that each cell in itself contains the same information of the previous. And you started out as one cell. And yet the split keeps happening. We are a being that it symbolizes this bifurcation. Unconscious, conscious. Right brain, right brain, left brain. Feminine, masculine. Constantly splitting. Constantly looking back at each other. Learning from each other. When God was whole, He couldn't learn, so He split Himself. And who is He, who is he looking back at? Who's the ultimate that He's looking back at? The same part of him that told him not to go. He doesn't understand. Well, this is how we achieve that. So are we not following a a profoundly divine path? By following the path of the fool. By going to the underworld. This is what Freud was talking about when he said, we need to get in touch with our legitimate human suffering. What's this other... The 20 or 30 year old something or other who's playing games his entire life who gets upset over some guy calling him a name on a game and he lost the game and he's upset. He's caught up in this illegitimate suffering. That's not even suffering. There's all this escapism going on from the legitimate suffering. But that truly is defined. It is godlike. The, sin, the old adage goes. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Yeah, right. And what is this? You gotta know what's toxic to know what to clean. This is the divine path. Wow. Are we teaching this to kids? Notice the two, the the male and the female, the two demons, they already have horns on their heads. Notice the chains wrapped around their necks. They're big enough that they can actually leave if they wanted to. Think of that toxic relationship. Can you not leave if you wanted to? Do you not have the freedom to just take the chain off and walk away? Of course you can. There's consequences of that, sure. If you're working at a job you don't like, can you leave? Absolutely. Nobody's keeping you there. Take the chain off. Well, this is also calling our attention to the concept of the master-slave dynamic. Notice the devil. He's holding this fire down. And we already discussed how the fire is, you know, that willful doing masculine aspect. Well, that's the suppression of another will. Master, slave. And I think most of us get that idea of like what it means to be the slave to the master. The tyrant kings and all that good stuff. But, is the master not a slave to the slaves in a different way? Imagine a doctor, he's working on a cure for some disease. And millions of people relying on him. And so he toils day and night. Not giving himself enough self-care, self-love, or doing what he truly wants to do. The master-slave dynamic actually works both ways. He can leave whenever he wants to, but he feels this sense of obligation. So, the master-slave dynamic is very inauthentic. We're not being our true self when we're stuck in that. So what's the alternative? The alternative is to dissolve this relationship. Get out of this master-slave dynamic, which is so prevalent in our culture, and actually turn it into what's called the 
Hegelian dialectic. And so we're going to touch on George Hegel for a moment, a German philosopher in the 18th and 19th century. So the Hegelian dialectic is basically what happens when two objects or entities meet and attain a higher state while retaining their history. And this is where we get to the heart of one of the main tenets of mysticism. Go and rule the mystical path. We are each other's teachers. That toxic relationship you were in, there's something to learn from it. Your toxic parents, there's something to learn from them. Anything, anything toxic, there's something to learn. Even, even if it wasn't toxic. Something that comes along and catches your eye. Any object or entity, person or thing. It's a mirror for us. Going right back to the duad concept. And yet, when this transformation happens, you don't suddenly lose yourself. Something else is added or shown, revealed. And there's a higher level of sophistication that occurs. But no, we're caught up in this master-slave dynamic. You're master for a day, you're slave for a day. One day you're winning, one day you're losing. You're stuck in the karmic path, not the dharmic path, not the true self. What is this struggle? What is your devil trying to teach you? You were brought here for a reason. It happened naturally. What's, what's speaking to you here? If you treat it as a lesson, and this is the point, this is very important to take away here. This is part of psychic hygiene. What is your relationship with your devil, with the cross that you bear? Do you treat it with animosity and fear? Your entire underworld cycle, your unconscious? Because if you do, yeah, you'll find demons there, all right. But what happens if you switch your perspective? And you realize that these are all mirrors for you to help you understand yourself more. It is going to help you tremendously to find peace and balance in the times ahead. In fact, I didn't touch on this, but it needs to be touched on now. The the wheel, and even the concept of zero, even if a wheel is turning... There's all this activity on the outer surface. But at the center, there's a, there's a point where nothing is moving. Same thing in a lever. You know, there's this over here and that over there. And at the center, there's a point that does not move and never changes location. The eye of the hurricane. Peaceful. But surrounded by chaos. All around it. Yes, you will learn... You will transform, but at the center of your being is still the point that remains unmoved. You'll always be that original adventure. The original, you'll never forget that. That's part of your history, that's part of your truth. But we come across our devils and our demons to grow from them. A quote from Hegel, Genuine tragedies in the world are not conflicts between right and wrong. They're conflicts between two rights. So the idea here is, you may come across a supposed problem, and you treat it as if it's a master and a slave thing. When you should be learning from it, and integrating something into it, gaining wisdom from this process. Invite your mirrors into your life. Revere them. If you've ever heard the concept of respect your opponent. There's some people who actually have paintings of their enemies. And if you don't understand what that means or why they're doing it, it may not make sense, but I hope it can make sense to you now. They revere what they've become. To defeat their enemy. And isn't this what happens in toxicity? When the psychopath arises? The sage rises to the challenge? 
the white blood cells don't start flooding your circulatory system until the toxicity comes around. It's when things get toxic that we rise to the occasion. So when the devil comes along, in order to get past it, yeah, we needed to develop self-love, but we also are going to find out about ourselves. And isn't that beautiful? Well, that, I already told you that's part of the divine path anyway. <laughs> Talk about purpose. When we learn from history... <clears throat> oh, sorry. We learn from history that we do not learn from history. Why do we still live in this foolish, irrational culture? Hegel said it himself. <laughs> so, so we do have this path of the fool, right? Where we're supposedly trying to learn. And that has to do with regression. And we know that foolishness is abundant. And that wisdom is not... Wisdom is in short supply. Is it because we're avoiding this process? Yup. That's why it's so important. The history of the world is none other than the progress of consciousness, of the consciousness of freedom. You can't regress without choosing to. So the very idea that we progress at all through this process exalts freedom to the highest degree. You don't make it through the underworld cycle without using your freedom. It's you, it's your personal journey, and it is idiosyncratic, it's unique. Not everybody's going to have the... It's, everybody's underworld cycle is going to be different. In the overworld cycle, as children, we learn through mimicry first. So we can learn from the Magi and the Emperor and the Empress and all these other archetypes. We can learn from them how they do what they do. But we don't get to mimic someone's underworld cycle, do we? Because that's all hidden. It's all in the dark. So it's a profoundly personal experience. But because of that, it doesn't involve the superego or culture. It involves you, your freedom, your rite of passage. And there is no guidebook for that. Moving on. The tower. So you just got past your devil, right? So let's say you broke up with the toxic boyfriend or girlfriend. You, uh, <clears throat> you got out of your job that you hated. Well, there's consequences, right? Imagine saying, we're done. Oh, well, the psychopath is just going <laughs> to kick and yell and scream and you're going to have to move out. There's all these other things that are going to happen. So there's going to be this extreme, well, it's a cardinal card. Well, because you're starting something new. The devil is a fixed card. You're stuck. But the tower also represents the, an unsustainable path. This is the negative aspect of this card. Building up something that just wasn't going to work. That could mean some like ludicrous business idea that wasn't going to work. You, just, you keep feeding it energy and it just falls apart under its own foundations. Or something else happens. Now in every tower card, there, well not every, most that I've seen, there's always two people falling. Because usually foolishness, unsustainable paths, other people suffer from your foolishness. It's not just you falling from the tower. You usually pull down someone with you. But what's the positive aspect of this card? Notice that it's an earth card. Yeah, you're coming back down to earth. You're about to get grounded. You just had a whirlwind of change. You just made it past your demons. And scary. Rite of passages you require a lot of courage. So you need time to... The whirlwind of change happens. 
The unsustainable path is now over. And it's time to get grounded again. That's the positive side to this card. So we're still not out of the underworld cycle, but we're, we're coming out. We're getting there. The star card. So this is like a cooling off period. It corresponds to Aquarius. You can see by the pictures being poured out. Notice, and even the act of pouring out that water is kind of like all the tension that was built up. You're just releasing everything. You're cooling off. Getting all the water, you know, all that emotional tension out. Notice how she's not wearing anything. There's no more armor. You don't need it anymore. You don't need to be on guard. You're past that. It's time to open up again. Aquarius is the sign that corresponds to this card and has a lot to do with freedom, you know, freedom loving. It's an air card. And without her armor on, she's definitely more free to be herself. And the water, she's also looking down at the water too. And going back to the feminine and the masculine, water is the first mirror that we ever had in the physical world. First chance we got to see ourselves. And this is one of the negative sides of the card is, is if we're looking at ourselves, and in our, <clears throat> in our culture, we, we, we're sold false senses of masculinity and femininity. What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? And if you have embraced a false feminine and an authentic feminine, and a man is trying to look to the feminine to understand what it means to be masculine, and then in turn, the feminine is now looking at the false masculine to learn what it means to be feminine, well, you get this weird social construct that is inauthentic. A mirror that is false, a mirror that is warped. As you're coming out of this cooling phase, you've made it past, but you have to be careful not to fall in some illusion again. Because the underworld cycle is a mysterious place on the off start anyway. Next card up, the moon, dealing very deeply with the subconscious, another mutable card, has to do with Pisces. Notice the two dogs on the front of the card. One is tamed, you know, like a house pet, another one is wild. One's the id, one's the superego. You know, the superego is what, what is tamed, the id is the wild one. But the ego is asleep, which is actually true. In, in Freudian psychology, the id is deep in your unconscious. The superego is also deep in your unconscious and partly in the conscious. And this is kind of corresponding to that. The ego is asleep. But even when the ego is asleep, the superego and the id are still active. And they're both crying out. They're both looking up to the ego while it is asleep. Because eventually, and this is a mutable card too, there's something going on deeply within us on an emotional level where we're bringing this all back in together. And I discussed the unconscious in depth in the first course, the first part of this workshop. About what's going on here, what this means. But moving on, 
the, moon, the ego is about to wake up, which is the next part of this process about, about getting out of the underworld cycle. When we enter the sun, that complements it. Obviously, fire sign. Planet rulers the sun, appropriately. And you have the sun child. The, the classical archetypal, you know, Jesus set from you know, Egyptian lore. All the sun gods. And born again. You know, you're rising out of the underworld cycle anew. You know, and this is the solar part. It is part of that masculine, you know, left brain type. The ego is now coming back online, um, and you're feeling this is a very positive card. You know, a brand new start. But a negative aspect about this has to do with um, actually the Egyptians' understanding of light. You know, they were definitely a aware of enlightenment or the concepts of it. They knew that light, just as easily as it could reveal something, could also blind you from something. And a lot of secret societies actually use that basic philosophy to distract people. If you look at news, my goodness... It's like this glaring metaphorical light just blinding you constantly. If that's what you watch all the time, you have no clue what's really going on in the world. If that's your one source of information. So we have to be careful to not be blinded by the light, by the sun, as we're coming back out of the overworld and be distracted from being our authentic self still. Let's not forget the lessons that we learned. Keep it within balance. And we come to the judgment card. <clears throat> so we have this angel. Up at the top looks a lot like Gabriel. And we have what looks like uh, resurrection. People coming out of tombs or you know, graves, coming back to life. But what's coming back to life? Well, once you get out of an underworld cycle, what's happening in the judgment card is one of the four, remember fire, earth, air, water, scent, one of the four, sensation, emotion, perception, and feeling, and intuition, I mean, one of those is awakening. When you get past this and you learn something about yourself, when I bit the, the stuffed animal, oh my goodness, a whole new level of emotion awoke within me. And that's what happens at the rites of passages. Perhaps you sense things more clearly. Perhaps your intuition is decluttered. You're able to come to knowledge quicker. Perhaps you do feel more, feel things you've never felt before. It's not just anything that's being awakened here. It's one of the four. And even Gabriel, I want to go, go into even what that means. In the original Hebrew text, to tie in some Kabbalistic tradition here, Elohim was the word that was used to say you know, the gods. It was actually plural. And all the angels were of God, right? Raphael, Gabriel, Mike, El, and others. They all had L at the end of them. A lot of angels had L at the end of their name. The Sibel Society from the Greeks. And Oracle. Oracle means orifice of El, of the gods. So when we talk about your inner oracle, we're talking about the orifice of the god, the voice of the god, What's the voice of your God? What's the voice of your inner wisdom talking about? So we have the, you know, this oracle, this, this angel, <laughs> you know, the, the prefix of Elohim became the suffix. 
of awakening, calling forth these senses, these perceptions again. And this is the good part. This is the benefit of going through this underworld cycle for us as individuals. <laughs> there had to be, there's some payoff. You know, you didn't go through all that pain for nothing. And when this card falls in a reading, you know, the, the quantum development, huge changes are coming. And you even see the red wings again. You saw that in the lover's card and in temperance. You know, there's an angel that keeps coming back. The red wings of love. You know, the angel that's always walking, that you're always looking to. In the Bible, the first imperative statement, the first commandment, I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments, but the first sentence that tells you something to do, actually says, Seek thee first the kingdom of heaven. And a few verses later, it tells you where it is. The kingdom of heaven can be found within. Got that right. Where's your inner oracle? You need to be listening to that. And finally, we have the world card. The universe card. Card number 21. 21 reduces to 3. 2 plus 1 <clears throat> is 3. You know your numerology. And what was that? Mother Earth. The Empress card. So the world going back to our world. Of course, the circle's there again. And this is just summing it all up. And it's not, it's not just any world. It's your world. It's your personal experience that just, that just happened. And this is a, now that we're closing up here, this is a process that we all go through. And hopefully, some of the symbolism that we've covered today has piqued your interest, shown you a little bit more about how you operate during your rites of passage. So you don't want to run away from them. Oh no, there's so much there. But you have to achieve self-love. My goodness gracious. If you do not do that, you will not make it. You will break upon the rocks at the shore underneath the waves. Like I said, it does not matter how intelligent you are, how much energy you have. No. You have to cultivate self-love. So, in closing, um, I wanted to invite you to look at uh, this area I've set up. It's actually the Tree of Life with the tarot embedded upon it. And I'm not going to go too much into it. I just want you to appreciate the symbolism at first. But each card... <clears throat> Because it's one through, you know, there's, there's 11 spots. So one out of the 22, well, there's going to be two in each spot. And these actually, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And each letter actually corresponded to an aspect of consciousness and of being. And that's where the, the tarot originated from was the, these are also aspects of our consciousness. So it's very deeply tied in to the Kabbalistic tradition. And this is where hopscotch came from, for goodness sake. If you played hopscotch, you're jumping on the tree of life. Now what? <laughs> that definitely made it through history. Like the Wheel of Fortune, the Hangman. But each of these cards are actually having a conversation with each other. You can see that the world and the wheel of fortune, pretty obvious connection there. The sun and strength card, very solar. The chariot and the moon with their lunar traits. There's a lot of connections. And we don't have enough time to go into it, but this is just something I wanted you to appreciate.
for a little bit. So, I hope you've enjoyed the class. I certainly enjoyed giving it. Um, Like I said, I think there's a lot of value in it. And (laughs) I just wanted to share this anecdotally real quick. Even the Ten of Discs has the uh, Tree of Life on it. This is very... They were very conscious of the Kabbalistic tradition when they were making all of this. So I hope you've enjoyed the class. Um, have a nice day.